Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Jim Kircher. Last week, the chief of the St. Louis Fire Department said that the city's paramedics see the impact of so much violence that they're quitting faster than he can hire replacements. Here to discuss the impact of violence in the area and the toll it takes on the morale and the mental health of those who provide emergency care are Helen Sandcool, who's Administrative Director of Regional Emergency Medical Services for SSM Health St. Louis University Hospital. She's been working in emergency medicine for more than 45 years, since 1973, and St. Louis Fire Department Public Information Officer, Captain Garen Mosby. Thanks, guys, for joining us today. Uh, Captain Mosby, the problem here uh, state it, and, and how bad is it? Right, so two to three paramedics a month are leaving the job. Uh, the call volume has not decreased, and it, it's the type of calls that we're seeing, right? Uh, the fire chief was, was very specific in, in the types of call, right? We're seeing you know, more trauma and trauma-related uh, results you know, from the paramedics, the firefighters, you can kind of compare it to a, a drop of water, you know, over the course of time, just a continuous over and over and over uh, traumatic experience is taking a toll. And if you can leave the St. Louis City Fire Department and go to another department where there's less trauma or get into a completely different field, that's what we're seeing our people do. Helen, we're talking about um, the changes. Is it in, in the years you've been involved in emergency uh, care, emergency medicine, has it drastically changed? Uh, it has. Well, as the environment gets more violent, um, we see an uptick in people trying to make decisions about if they really want to be a helper um, or a healer. And, you know, the thing we have to take into consideration is that um, our emergency medical services staff, they are not law enforcement. Um, they are actually, what I just said, helpers and healers. And when you talk to them, and you ask them, you know, what is one of the things that is a primary concern about your job? About 20% will say, my personal safety. So when it gets to the point where you have, you know, one out of five people that the main concern about their job is personal safety, um, that has a big impact on your career as well as on your family and your everyday life. What, what, what first of all, draws people into emergency medicine or being a first responder in EMT? Because it has to be a sense of um, enthusiasm, in a way, to, to really make a difference and do something for people who, help, who, who need it. Right. I, I would speak to that personally. That's, that's why I joined, right? You want to you make a difference. It might sound like something you, you, a sound bite or something you'd hear in a movie, but that's why folks are signing up. You get out here. And the fact of the matter is our, our, our paramedics, EMTs, our first responders are making a difference, but it's just taking a heavy toll on them physically and, and on the mental health aspect. It must drive people out. First of all, even when things are normal, people can find this to not be uh, their end of the business. No, it's a, it, it must take a special um, kind of person, let's say, to work in an emergency room and, and really want to stay there. You know, if you work for the city of St. Louis, I mean, when you look at our violence-related cr crime and trauma, in the last five years, we've been up there in the top five. Um, this is a place that is um, different than many others. So, you know, working a year on the streets of the city of St. Louis is like working 10 years someplace else, as far as the volume, as far as the experience. And the one thing is that, you know, it's very hard to predict um, violent encounters because um, these men and women, they take it for granted. This is, they take this as part of their job. Uh, and it should never be part of your job to be an EMS provider going to, to try to help someone or to be an emergency department nurse or physician that are, is standing by to help someone that they don't even know. Uh, most of the time during the lowest parts, points in their life and to be spit on, cursed out, slapped, um, you know, assaulted. Is it the, the way they're being treated or what they're mm -hmm. seeing in terms of the kinds of uh, trauma, the violence, the injuries? Is it all of those things? Well, I, I think, first of all, we have a problem with drugs in our communities. We have a problem with um, alcohol. 
uh, in our communities. And with poverty, with unemployment, different things like that, you put all those things together and um, you have an impact on um, you know, the environment that you live in. And that gets extended to the person that's coming to help you. So uh, again, a lot of times I think that um, we look at emergency medical services maybe as you know, a partner with law enforcement. And uh, law enforcement, our police officers, our firefighters, and our EMS um, are all, all part of one family. But um, when your EMS providers come to a scene, um, a lot of times they only know half the story. So that makes it an unsafe environment to begin with. And on day one, we teach you in paramedic class is you never go into a space if the scene is not safe. Well, unfortunately, half the time they think the scene might be safe, and they come in and they find out a whole different situation. We saw that a couple weekends ago in Cedar Hill where we had firefighter paramedics that w responded to a house fire, and when they got to the scene, they had a shooter, active shooter, shooting at them. Um, so again, that took a whole different turn in what's going on, and that's not something that you sign up for when you want to become a paramedic. You want to get out there and help people. And you then you find you yourself, yeah, yeah. You know, I, just speaking, getting back to that, that the question you asked last, is it, is it how they're being treated or what they're seeing? And I think it's a combination of both, but leaning more towards what you're seeing, right? There was a drive-by shooting. I listened to your, the previous segment, and we were talking about violence. There was a drive-by shooting, uh, and there were five kids outside, you know, ranging from 10 years and down, and there was a drive-by shooting, and a three-year-old girl was killed in that shooting, right? Your listeners need to know there's, there's help out there for first responders, but personally, I didn't go to work the next day. Right. I, I needed a day because I have a three year old child and talking to the responders that were on that call, hearing some of the graphic details, uh, you know, you have a wide range of emotional response to that. And this is something that we're seeing over and over and over again. You only hear about a, a, a small percentage of them on the news, but your first responders are seeing these things firsthand. Your police officers are getting there to do the law enforcement function. Your firefighters and EMS providers are getting there to stabilize whatever situation we can stabilize. And then we're transporting to the ERs and it's just a repetitive, repetitive just nature. And it is, it's seriously taking a toll. There's a study out there, uh, 2017, the Ritterman study on mental health and suicide for first responders. 103 firefighters committed suicide. 140 police officers. Now that's in comparison to 93 firefighters dying in the line of duty and 129 police officers in the line of duty. So the, the simple fact of the matter is, speaking specifically for you know law enforcement and, and, and firefighters, we're dying more so at our own hands than we are in the line of duty. That's how serious this is becoming. It's not just St. Louis, right? We can speak to it because we, we live here and we work here, but this is a national challenge. And if you're having, it seems to me that if you're having problems um, filling the jobs and I'm staying, you're working me that much harder. Excellent point. The, the chief spoke to I this. I don't like to be worked that right. hard when the job's hard enough, right? right? The, the, we try to staff the city with 12 medic units, 62 and a half square miles, 12 medic units. Now, realistically, we need more units on the street. We'd like to bump that to 18, but we can't staff the 12 we have. So you, you see the challenges that we're facing. And, and, you know, these guys, uh, they come to work every day because they love what they do. Uh, they don't come in to work every day to get, you know, screamed at or cursed at or, or, or whatever. And if you look at just statistics, um, if you look at on-the-job injuries nationwide, you have 1.8 per 10,000 workers. That's general population. But when you look at EMS, just the risk of non-fatal assault uh, and that's not just being punched in the nose and coming to work the next day. That means losing work time is 6 out of 100. So that is 30% higher than the national average. That is huge. Yeah, we're talking with Helen Sandkul, who's Administrative Director of Regional Emergency Medical Services for SSM Health St. Louis University, and Captain Garen Mosby of the St. Louis Fire Department. Um, is there, when we hear, for example, we hear about PTSD often in the military, we're dealing with really the same sorts of issues here. Are we also dealing with this idea that, um, 
we're all tough guys and gals and, um, you know, suck it up, we don't talk about this? Or is there more of a um, communal, you know, self-support group going on or a little bit of both? I would say a, a little bit of both, right? You, you watch the movies, you watch the television shows, and the firefighter, the, the paramedic, the EMT, the police officer, the ER nurse, I mean, they're great shows about these professions. And they are the tough people. They're the heroes. But the reality is uh, we, we have got to check ourselves, right? And that's, that's, that's a lot of what we're, we're learning. There's got to be a cultural shift. Uh, we are humans, you know, you, you see something traumatic, it's going to affect me just like it affects you. But we have to check on each other. You know, there's a lot of, uh, there's CISD, right? Critical incident stress debriefing. If I go on a traumatic call and I see something, well, there's that reactive uh, system in place that I can go and talk about it. What we're trying to do on the St. Louis City Fire Department, it's being discussed in a, in a concept of phase is a peer support group, right? Like the, the, you go to 10 calls and it's going to have an effect. Don't wait on that one call and then ask for help. And that, that's another thing. We, we don't necessarily ask for help, but the numbers are staggering. And so that's, that's on us, right? We have to do a bit more of that in changing our culture. You know, I, I love Chicago PD. I love <laughs> Chicago Fire. I love Chicago Med. And I just cringe when something horrible happens. What do we see? We see them all at the bar taking straight shots, double shots of whiskey. Right. That is not the answer. And, no, you know, but is that a reality? Yes. That is a reality. Yes. Okay. That Very is a reality. So. Yeah. yeah I, I, mean, I worked night shift for years, and believe it or not, um, you know, the hot spot was Regazzi's on the Hill, 7 a.m. Um, whoever thought they were open at that time, but they were open for us. <laughs> yeah, and the, the idea that going out to help somebody, but you have to put on a, uh, a bulletproof vest, is that, is that common? Is that a standard? Uh, the Cedar Hill incident, um, the providers had Kevlar vests available. Uh, no, you should never. Somebody that's coming to risk their life to help you should never have to arm themselves or should never have to wear a bulletproof vest. But that's not reality. Right. I was going to say it shouldn't have to, but that is reality. All of our vehicles, mine included, I have a vest in my car. You know, you go on some of these calls and the scene's supposed to be secure. You know, Helen spoke to that a little while ago. You're not supposed to enter the scene until it's secure. Uh, but sometimes that's not the case. Uh, you have to plan for the unexpected. We've got a tactical med crew that actually goes with the SWAT. So uh, it shouldn't be the reality, but it is. Yeah, the interesting thing, and I'd heard this before, and I'm not sure if this is sort of a, a sidelight to this, that um, that the the uh, the ambulance folks and the EMTs and, and whatever uh, have have the people trust them more than they do police that they're very very often being called to situations because they have a credibility and that always speaks well to to how people perceive them um, I don't know if that that helps or hurts the situation but I thought that was a very interesting uh, idea that people sometimes call the, for an ambulance when they re what they really need is a police officer yes. and you're shaking your head yes you know we, we train early on that you know you cannot work in this field and be judgmental um, you know you, addiction is a disease we see a lot of addiction um, we see people again you know at points in their life that you know you don't want to be around but that's part of what you're here for so um, that is a, a big component um, of, you know, not being judgmental, not holding court on the streets. And, um, you know, a lot of times they trust firefighters uh, and nursing more than they trust police officers. Uh, since 9-11, when they did the Gallup poll, every year since 9-11, except for one year, which was 9-11, Nurses came out as the most trusted profession, and then in 9-11, when we had the big one in New York City, firefighters came out as the, the most trusted profession. So there must be some proactive approach to this, because if, if, I'm, if I'm one of your guys and you say, how you doing, Jim, I'm going to say I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. Right. Leave me alone. Uh, but do you, do you take a proactive approach to make sure that I'm not just trying to walk away from this? Right. And... I alluded to this earlier in that we were, the chief and I actually having this discussion a week or so ago uh, to the creation of a, a peer group. Nothing that you force folks to go through, but something that's available just in case you need it. Because there's a lot of sidebar conversations. You know, back when I was actually in a firehouse, you resolved everything around the kitchen table. We talked to each other. 
uh, now with the addition of cell phones, you know, it, it, it's something that you even see with your kids, right? You're, you're on your phone more, and maybe we're not having those discussions. Uh, but trying to be more proactive, checking in on your, your brother or your sister, right? We're a family. So the people that I work with, I know what's going to affect them. I've seen, you can see the changes. Yeah, I was wondering about that. Right, you right. guys must be able to see the signs, even if I'm not, if, well, even if I'm telling you I'm fine. Well, that, that's a part of being in the house. And it's just like a family member, right? I, Helen and I, we work in the same house. I'm used to Helen and her routine. So we go on this traumatic call or we go on a series of calls and Helen's acting out of sorts. That's on me, right? This is my family member and we've got to do a better job of that. Uh, as first responders and checking on each other. You see it on social media all the time. At the end of a tweet, they'll say, check on your brother, check on your sister. It's a continual reminder that that we have to look out for one another, just like on the street. What's the danger here? Um, Clearly, you know, you've you've got, as you mentioned, putting more work on a smaller staff. Um, That's going to bring burnout. Right. It's going to be, you know, it's going to, I'm, now I'm going to leave even though I was handling the job okay. Now I'm going to leave because you're overworking me. But right. where, what, what are the steps involved here in beginning, uh, starting to remedy this? I mean, besides public understanding, which I'm not sure how much good that's going to do you. Well, you, you know, for, for your staff, I mean, as an administrator, I want to make sure that my patients get the best care um, all times uh, of the day or night. Um, that means I need to be well staffed. Well, you know, I guess what I hate to do is I know a nurse has worked her three 12-hour shifts, and then I go up to her and I said, you know, tomorrow night's horrible. If I don't get another nurse tomorrow night, I don't know what I'm going to do. Don't guilt people. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we have a lot of nurses that are pushing that four and that five-day schedule instead of three because they, they care about what they do and they love their coworkers. Um, and you can only do that for so long. So there has to be a gap there. There has to be some solution. Now, for violence and with EMS, a lot of that is going to be education. You know, um, making sure that we don't have a bunch of green kids out on the street and we don't have anybody experienced. You know, that, that gut feeling, that street smart, that how do you answer a call uh, on, you know, do you walk in front of the door or do you stand on the side of the door? A lot of different things like that. Um, so education is one. The other one is making sure that you don't put yourself in a bad situation. So you always look where you're at, you know, where there's an exit. Um, and sometimes, you know, it might get to the point where in order to save your life, you have to defend yourself. I, I imagine still on your staff and even for you guys, uh, you, you, there are people who believe in what they do. They're willing to put up with this. You have to identify those and make them, in a sense, the, 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 the foundation maybe of the next generation. Because there's always new people who are going to come up and say, I, I want to do this. I, this is what I want to do. Yeah. And, you know, there's always there's husbands, there's wives, and there's parents. And they might not like where you're working or what you're doing. And that's part of reality, too, because you come home, you don't live at work, you live at home. So you have to make sure that, you know, the most important thing in life should be your family. And unless you're a millionaire, the second most important thing in life should be your job. So um, you have to, you know, make sure that you have that happy medium also. Speaking to something uh, Helen mentioned, uh, basically encouraging your employees to take care of themselves. Uh, we've got an EAP program for the, the city of St. Louis. EAP stands for? Employee Assistance Program, mm-hmm. right? You. So basically you can go and, and get help privately, confidentially. No one needs to know. I've been in those rooms, and I've sat across from a therapist just like I'm sitting across from you, and there's there's a bit of a disconnect. So it might not be a bad idea to invest more in uh, a therapist that's specifically geared towards the needs of first responders, Right? We've got to take a look at, at how we hire people. Uh, obviously, we're not getting the job done. We're not attracting candidates. There's got to be more pay. Do you look at the psychological profile for, for these these jobs? We don't have a psychological yeah, okay. profile. If you want to do it, you're hired? Is that? <laughs> well, I'm not, I'm not going to say it. it's that lean. Right, no. but, you but, never uh, wanted to get to that point right. where there's nobody to do the job. Because, I mean, when we look at EMS, um, they really have an impact on patients' outcomes. I mean, people are going to die if we don't have EMS on the streets. And it speaks to how good our EMS is because of how many shootings we have and how many people we save. Great. Right? That's how good we are. 
Well, thanks so much. Again, thanks for your work, and, and this is a serious issue, and we'll, we'll have to keep track of this. I want to thank Helen Sandkool, Administrative Director of Regional Emergency Medical Services for SSM Health St. Louis University Hospital, and St. Louis Fire Department's Public Information Officer, Captain Garen Mosby, for joining us today. Thanks both for coming today. Thank you. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWNU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at ChooseWood.com.